So there'll be a lot happening in the morning. So we'll start with Gino. We're also going to be broadcasting to the harebrained audience to help to create more awareness for Rise for Water. So Darlene here will be broadcasting what's happening and we'll be asking people online to please donate. So it's a great way to raise, remember all this money goes to charity, so who knows, we might be able to raise a few extra thousand dollars today just by you know giving a behind the scenes peek. Yeah, you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, you live? Yes. Okay, so we're live now. Yes, you oh, are. there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow. All right guys, so everyone that's out there watching, welcome to Toronto, Canada. We're here with Gino Chapman, myself, and Tristan Morrison. Uh, we're gonna be doing some demonstrations this morning. And we're going to keep reminding you guys about Rise for Water. It's the charity that we're here for. It's going to uh, try to raise uh, hopefully $50,000 for um, Water Aid Canada. And that money goes to help uh, women in, in Marrakesh. Is it Marrakesh? Madagascar. Madagascar. Madagascar sorry, yeah. Madagascar. Um, who I was interested to learn spend over three hours a day just harvesting water for their families. Imagine what they could do with the rest of that time. All right, so we're going to kick it off with Gino. Beautiful. Well, good morning. This is my beautiful model, Lena, here. Uh, yesterday, I want to have to give a shout out because we have some fantastic artists from the Hair Color Magic team, Lupe Ross. Um, and what we did first with Lena's hair, we added some texture. So I asked if we could perm her hair. So we kind of altered the texture because I see some beautiful texture in the audience also. So um, what we're going to do is because Lena hair has very thick, thick, and as of course, sometimes the Asian hair, the follicles just quite. Large. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with that and we're going to help to expand the shape. So I am going to be working from the front. The beautiful thing about this hair cut already, she already has a guide for me, is because she has a fringe. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be working off the fringe. I am going to be working forward, so a slightly roundish shape. What I am going to be doing is try to extend the corners as large as possible so I get this really fantastic shape through here. Once I get that shape through here, I am going to come through the back. I'm going to be working on a slight graduated mode, working off pivot sections and making sure that the sectioning patterns that I do have here really mirror the anatomy jawline. And then I'm gonna be coming up through the top, flattening it slightly, and then working into a much horizontal building and expanding more weight to the corners. So I have this just beautiful uh, type of triangle shape with this rounded kind of bit through here. Um, what I do have to say is her, noticing while I was sectioning, her scalp is quite elastic, which is gonna benefit me. So the more tension is the name of the game for this haircut I'm going to be pulling small side teeth of the comb, add as much tension on the texture that we already applied to the haircut, uh, to the, the hair itself already. And um, I'm gonna try to expand it as much as possible. And uh, we already had a fantastic uh, journey yesterday looking at how crazy the, the perm came out. And um, hopefully the shape will mirror that also. So I'm gonna get started. I love that you're gonna use the uh, tension and use the elasticity of the scalp. I think that, you know, as a hair cutter, it's not just about the shape you're cutting, it's all the little things that kind of come into it. Um, this is my model, Natasha. Um, and I've done some pre-sectioning, and we did some great pre-coloring. You can see her roots are kind of red, she's got hot roots. I complained to the colorist, I'm like, what the hell, no. We did it on purpose, she's got these beautiful red roots, so it'll be almost kind of like an anime bob. You know when you think of like that, it'll have this beautiful kind of little um, Louise Brooks kind of shape to it with a nice contour graduation simple haircut all done with a straight edge razor and then I'll use I'll weave through with a little bit of slicing to kind of give it that shine line quality or anime quality I've started off um, in the hairline uh, doing some undercutting so the actual bob will sit on top of this and you know for me a lot of times with this type of precision work because it is going to be precision work even though it's done with the razor um, when I want that to sit really well, I'll do a bit of undercutting. And I'd say this is probably the most organic part of the whole haircut. I just came in visually, kind of roped it off, so to speak. I just took the hook of the comb and I looked at the way the hairline grew. I don't want a perfect section for the undercut because I think that'll be a little too pedestrian where it's just like, oh, here's my undercut, I'm a punk rocker, you know? <laughs> like, I want this to actually disappear into the haircut. So I just kind of visually, looked at the way the hair was growing and falling. So the section, it's not even technically like woven. I just looked at the high points and low points of how it was falling. And then here, I'm using what I like to call flat razoring, which means using the flat or the whole body of the blade to collapse the hairline and get it to lay down in in a very kind of um, uncut way. You know, when I look at it, 
visually with this type of razor, I'm looking for a newborn baby's hairline, I think is the best way I can describe it. If you've ever seen that, it just kind of peters out in a very natural way. And then I'll get into some very, very technical cutting. I'll be using kind of a bastardized version of a very classic inside out haircut where you put your baseline in here and you gradually rotate and elevate to create a beautiful graduation kind of like this. So it's like a graduated bob in reverse, keeping the weight fairly low. And I'll be doing it all with the razor um, to just give it a kind of uh, a little bit more of a lived in quality. So I'm gonna carry on doing the undercutting here and I will move along to my good buddy of over 25 years, Tristan Morrison. Hey guys, um, this is my model, Aya. And uh, I'm gonna be working with some asymmetry, something that kind of starts off a little bit shorter in the front and gets longer towards this side. And the balance points that I'm thinking for this is gonna have a little bit more structure on the shorter side, and then it's gonna go into some softness. Um, one of the things I like to do with my work is I like to use uh, a variety of tools to get different effects. So I'm gonna be using scissors to, to create a little bit more strength in the perimeter, and then I'm gonna be going and transitioning into a razor to give a little bit more soft fluidity to the, uh, to the layer side. And this is gonna expose some of the, uh, the color that we have underneath here. And Lupe Voss and her team just really did a great job in lightening some of this area. So a lot of um, you know the idea we talked about yesterday, where to place the color, which I think is important when you're working with asymmetry. The sectioning pattern comes from a really old haircut, one of my favorites, uh, called the sweep, and uh, it's essentially a circle divided into four. It's sad that we have to call that really old. Yeah, that's yeah. like what I <laughs> that's learned. I, you know, when I was like 21, I was learning the sweep, and now it's really old. But, but the nice thing about it is it's kind of being like uh, talked about a little bit more. I mean, uh, one of our good buddies, Julian's doing some, uh, some classes on it on, on harebrained and showing you kind of these, these contemporary classic patterns. So it just kind of sparked my memory to, to be able to section off like this. And it, it applies really well to, to a shape like this. So the top's gonna be a little bit more disconnected and then the underneath a little bit more structure. So really just starting at the front and, and applying kind of like no tension and cutting like a really nice one length. Um, sitting at the cheekbone because she has great cheekbones which then exposes this little bit of uh, color that, uh, that's been placed in there by Lupe and the team. Mr. Gina. Yo, all right. Well, still working off my front sections and working with diagonal backs. Um, again, slightly roundish shape. Again, trying to extend more of the corners through here. Um, the one thing that I am really paying attention to is my palm to palm. I can pull a lot more tension um, pulling towards my body right now. And I'm really using my body as an anatomy. I do have her, her chin slightly down, but I keep aiming more towards my chest and my chin so I can watch my elevation. Each time I take one section from one side, I do take a slight bit of a section just to make sure I'm checking my elevation and make sure I'm checking my guide each time I move. And again, I'm not trying to move as much. Um, I do have a chair in my way, so her head is slightly tilted towards me. Like I said, her chin is down, so I'm really just trying to get that effect, but I want it much more of a, of a harder corner if that, um, if that makes it with that rounder shape that we here. And again, just really watching my elevation slowly, almost like ticking the, the hands of a clock through here, and the second hand, and just moving very gently up through there. But definitely still a lot of tension on this hair strand. So Gino, do you want to perhaps talk a little bit about the Rise for Water for the people who are at home watching? You got some people watching, Darlene? We have some people watching. We oh, have yeah. people <laughs> watching. Yeah, so um, for those of you who don't know, uh, we raise money all over the world for clean water. For those audience members who are not familiar with Rise for Water or also the Clean Water Act uh, for the U.S. or also internationally, we just try to raise awareness for clean water for everyone so everyone has a well to get water from a place in the village they can grab water from so a lot of them don't have to trek for miles just to grab clean water for the families. And they usually do this about two to three times a day, which is sometimes up to five hours away just to grab water. So uh, I find that cutting hair today and actually bringing awareness for everyone even out there. So if you can, even I think the smallest donation we were talking about is $5. Yep. 
Yeah. So if you can, we do have riseforwater.com, and we're going to keep saying that and keep pushing it, almost like a telethon, I feel, in a way. <laughs> um, like, keep going, drive that number up. But if you can, you can just go on, you can log in. Um, I think, do we have a, a little click and link? Is there a yeah, yeah, in, in, the, uh, in the description, you can just click uh, riseforwater.com and hit the donate button. Beautiful. Yeah, so if you go into uh, Rice for Water and click on the link, you can donate eating from the comfort of your own sofa. But hopefully... Uh, well, they're you all driving right now. Oh, right? Exactly. Yeah. From yeah. your dashboard. Yeah. So we would appreciate it, again, coming up here, hanging out in beautiful Toronto, but also a great for a great cause. And also we have a great audience for those out there also coming and hanging out with us too. So, yeah. yeah, and every everyone that's here, all their uh, tuition is being donated as well. So, you know, we're always talking about community, hairdressing kids, you know, the buzzword of the past, uh, let's even say decade. This is a chance to really show that community, you know. We very rarely ask for anything, but this is a good ask, you know, helping create clean water. Okay, let's get back to the technique. So I've done the un undercutting in the back nape there. Again, very, very organic. Now I'm gonna do it along her hairline too. It was very kind of weak here. Um, and she's, you know, beautiful, beautiful girl, but she's very petite and very narrow. So I feel like opening this up is gonna allow the hair behind it to swell more. Rather than, to me, very often hair is like Velcro. And when there's hair underneath it, it pulls it in closer to the head. I feel like with the hairlines being undercut, it'll allow it to swell out more um, in a subtle way. And especially because I'm kind of almost graduating this undercut in a way by pulling the sections down and focusing on the ends. So that'll pop it, pop it up. So subtle thing, but I also, and especially with the red there, I think, you know, really, really pretty to expose that. So I'm glad that uh, we came up. It was my, my brilliant idea. <laughs> See how things change so quickly? It started off as, just in case it wasn't, in case it wasn't working, it would, it would have stayed Tristan's idea, but since it's, now it's working, it's my idea. All right, so I'm gonna get into the technique now. That's again, just the hairline. Now I'm gonna take a section that is almost vertical, to be honest, um, at a very, very slight diagonal, but almost vertical. Could maybe even be a little more vertical than that. And fine, I think, you know, again, a lot of times people think you're working with the razor, take thick sections, it's all about texture, chopping up the hair. It can be, and that can be actually quite beautiful, but it doesn't have to be. Here I'm going to work in a very technical way. I'm going to hold this hair down nice and low. Fine teeth to the comb, nice even tension. Putting my hand right below the jawline. Coming in now with what we call the edge of the razor and a very small closed stroke to begin to cut in a line. You know, what you cut off is what you leave on. So this is as close to a scissor uh, line as you're going to get with a razor. It's not going to stay that way. If I was going to do the whole haircut like that, I'd probably just use a scissor, to be honest with you, unless I just felt like doing something different. But for me, as I elevate and rotate, the stroke will get more and more open. So as the hair gets longer and more graduated, it also gets more textured, which takes away the weight line in the heavy corner that you might typically get. Does that make sense? So this line becomes softer and softer and softer as I rotate it up into the shape to create the graduation. And I'm gonna carry on that way. Take me a few sections to um, get to the back of the ear and then I'll change my pattern a little bit through the back. So I've kind of gone in and I've started to work with this stronger outline, really kind of keeping it uh, more one length and now I'm adding the graduation uh, to it. And Really, um, what I'm thinking about is building some length towards there. So the, the two components I think about when I'm cutting hair is how am I going to move the hair back and forth, so my over direction, and knowing that if I, if I pull the hair away from the, the back, it's going to get longer towards the back. So pull away from what you want to keep. And then the idea of lifting hair up and down. Am I going to lift it between zero and nothing, one to 89 or 90 above, and that's gonna give me my technique. So I wanna kind of build a little bit of weight in this, so I'm gonna be working with some graduation that's shorter at the front and gets longer towards the back. And so really the tricky part about that is keep being consistent with my elevation, right? And just making sure that I, I'm kind of marking spots on the chair 
really like where are my fingertips pointing to on this side and, and, and making notice to, to making marks in these areas so that on the other side I can do the same thing if I'm looking for symmetry. You know, and I think that I think that that's what I find really fun about cutting hair is is trying to to improve upon my skill and knowing that it's not about perfection; it's just about getting better. And you know, when you're watching a lot of um, online tutorials, it's really about applying things to your day-to-day -day work and just taking things out that you can use on your on your guests right away. So again, guys, we'd love you know questions, thoughts. At any time, from both our uh, our live viewers, we're here with a great room full of uh, cat Canadian hairdressers. Anybody come across the border for this? No. Okay. We, oh, you did. Awesome. We have one. Where from? New York. Right on. How was your? Are you driving? Good. How far is that? About three hours. Nice. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Did you uh, get stopped by Border Patrol? No. I didn't. Oh. <laughs> oh. Nice. No. No. Uh, traffic stop. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Right on. So again, guys, and also if you are having a hard time seeing anything, feel free to come up and stand wherever you want, okay? Or, you know, if you say, can you turn this way? We do our best to try to show what we're doing. And, you know, again, the idea is to just really kind of expose you to a whole bunch of different things. Uh, not literally, Gino. Don't do what you, <laughs> don't do what you did last time. <laughs> yeah, I said, not so. last time. Not what we did. He takes that off. He's got a chain mail, like, tank top on. Well, Tristan really wanted to do a magic mic routine up here, but I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> So, so, so <laughs> leaves, yeah. uh, really quickly, I started in the front again because I just wanted to kind of set the tone for uh, the shape being put in. Again, slightly rounded. Now, I would love to say that, again, I'm eyeballing the length and all that, but um, Lena here did give me yesterday a parameter of what lengths I could work with. So um, what I am going to do is still take, thinking about that fringe that I took from the front and working through the back. Now, again, the, the sectioning... I think is extremely important because whatever guide I set right here is going to kind of set the tone for the rest of the cut to the back. And again, I want the same type of length here. I am going to move the same length and it's going to really work into that jawline. Um, again, I'm going to just be cleaning that up. I do know that this perm is set in, so I am going to put a lot of tension in. The more I put on top of it, I know it's going to spring and look shorter. So again, I want to still create this quite softness and much more expansion. I don't want the shape to become too static. So I am going to be cutting a little on the lengthier side with this and as I move through to build the shape itself. But again, I want just this wonderful um, kind of juxtaposition of two shapes combining together through the graduated through the back and the softness through the front here. So, and again, you sound really smart when you talk. Try. Yeah. I just I, well, I looked at all the words. I looked at all the words that Tristan, Tristan uses and I'm like, I need to get out my thesaurus. <laughs> Oh, for God's sake, just come up with a question someone. Yeah. <laughs> Making us look bad. Gerard can be inti intimidating sometimes. Yeah, right. It's the trolling. Yeah, it's the trolling. Okay, so you can see I'm moving into the back here. So, again, to recap, the sections here were what we'd call kind of parallel to the hairline or vertical diagonal back. The hair was pretty fine, so I didn't do a lot of lifting. And my hand was kind of much more on, on a, you can see the angle pretty clearly. I did like the whole haircut to me. Sometimes it happens faster on really thick hair. Here it's kind of happening really kind of slowly. It get, her hair gets thicker towards the inside. So around the perimeter, I'm kind of literally doing this, if you notice. Okay, see that? And that, that hand kind of rotating a little bit is a big part of that. So let me take another section. And you can see how now they're curving from about the middle of the ear. This would be the second section. Now our hair starts to get a lot thicker and our head shape starts to change. So I can start to elevate and open the blade and rotate a little bit more. So as I come in here, I grab some of this hair, I spin it around. This is where you start to see the angle of the graduation in a subtle way. You see that? If you think back to some of our um, haircuts like a wedge or a firefly, you're starting to see it now. I'm going to be a little bit more closed here because I'm by the back of the ear. Then I can be a little more open as I get in here. And literally, it'll look different. 
closed will be more blunt and open will be more tapered. So really sketching on the surface of the hair. Getting into a pretty thick area here. So again, a little bit of elevation, lots of rotation. I would really naturally be standing here and bringing my way around. And I should start to see that perimeter happening. You guys can see what I mean by that kind of 1920s looking bob. You know, it's going to round in with the hairline at the back and have a nice angle there, and then it's going to have a textured graduation. And then this stuff that I've pre-sectioned away on the top, that's kind of for dessert, so to speak. I don't know exactly how I'm going to cut it, but in some kind of a freehand way, kind of slicing or cutting up into it and let it veil over the shape. Um, but this is all the foundation of it here. Again, curving through. You know, over the years, I've evolved into a very simple hair cutter. Um, I try not to do overly complicated things because I, I just ends up looking overly complicated. Um, so for me, my taste level has gone to what's the simplest way I can do it in the least amount of steps and, you know, kind of get something that looks really pure without it being overly complicated or without, to some degree, without almost giving too much meaning or importance to it. You know, meaning like, oh, it's, you know, it's a this or it's a that. It's just a simple bulb. Just going to be really pretty on her. That's my goal. Yeah, with some texture. Elevating, open, and rotate. You know, I think it's interesting what Gerard was just saying about a simple bob because it starts off with so many complexities in your first five years where you think about it so much just to be at the end a simple bob and trying to find out like easier ways to, to make your work look really nice and you know, I think the razor is a great kind of tool to uh, to make that oh, happen. Oh, he's got the blade out. Oh, we love it. Do you want me to teach you a couple of things? Please do. Yeah. I'm always learning. Yeah. You know, um, and I've been working um, with the razor for about, I would say about 10 years now. Gerard kind of, uh, you know, kind of got me interested in it and started to, you know, say how great it was to work with. and. It's a tool that I use about 60% of the time now just because I like the softness that it gives and the fluidity and the combination of working with a scissor and a razor just gives me that, that a little bit of lived in look with the hair. I've gone in and put my outline in with the scissors. I worked a little bit of brown graduation with uh, a diagonal section, more of a vertical diagonal section going towards the back which was making the graduation a little bit leaner or, or go further up the head, if you will. Now I'm coming through with similar sections to, to Gerard and working a little bit more loosely with the razor. And I'm taking a bigger stroke and kind of, that's what it's looking like um, when I'm holding it in my fingers. So that's what it's lying against the head like with a little bit more texture. One of the things that, that took me a while to get used to is how to hold the razor. And this idea of being able to lock it in so I didn't cut my thumb. Uh, all the time and, and the idea of holding your comb with a different finger than, than what you normally would to spin it. Just you know really practicing these kind of things at home before I started working with, uh, with the razor on, on hair. Working with more of a mannequin just to get used to the instrument uh, in my hand. And so really going through and just making this a little bit more diffused. And you can see that you're getting that graduated effect, but I really love the way this looks kind of sitting on the, the cheekbone area, and I think that it complements in this area well. And you can already see, like, I mean, with the length that she has here, the balance is working quite well with the asymmetry. So this side's kind of, it's looking good already, and I haven't done much to it. So I'll just use the, the razor more as a freehand tool on this side as I move towards it. But continuing taking these sections that are a little bit more diagonal and they don't have to be perfectly connected so it's you know this looser guideline cool all right I'm gonna jump in really quickly now I'm working in the nape area again working uh, on a leaner effects and then I'm working with much more corner through here now the one thing I do have to say is I add I had to go back and adjust my left side and I think it's all about when you start to cut these where exactly are your feet where are they positioned at? So you always have this type of finger to chest relationship. When your feet move, your hands move, everything will start to slightly um, adjust itself, maybe for the better or maybe something slightly longer. So I found that I was slightly long on the left side, which I knew that I had to start to move my feet slightly gently into that. So the more I can move, the more I'll start to remove that little bit. 
in that corner. So I adjusted it, and I feel that I, I have it nice and set. So I worked from a vertical, again, working slightly, pivoting through, and I ended up, if you can call this maybe horizontal, with a slight bit of diagonal, so the weight is slightly built a little heavier. Now the sectioning patterns to the top here, um, they are going to come through on a vertical, and again, I'm gonna end up trying to really emphasize on that horizontal and aim for some of these guides that I have at the front here. So I already have a guide from <coughs> the front, I have a guide that I'm gonna be generating from the back, and then everything else, I'm gonna really watch my body and watch my hands to make sure that that graduation is really sitting quite nice. Again, working with a lot of tension, because I find in this part of the scalp here, it's quite elastic. So I'm Went on it as tough as I possibly can and move into that area. Don't hurt it. Don't hurt it. Don't hurt the curl. So if you're watching from home, thank you for joining us. Um, if you've just joined us, uh, basically what's happening here is we're doing a demonstration for charity. We've got a room full of dolly. Can you show everyone that's, that's here? All right, say hi, guys. We've got a room full of dolly dresses from all around Canada. Oh, we got a coffee spill. Can somebody? Yeah. Room full of hairdressers from all around Canada. They've uh, paid to be here, and all the money that they paid is going to be donated to um, Water Aid Canada. So, if um, if you're out there watching, we'd love to ask you to also donate. You can donate as little as five dollars, um, and all that money will go to Water Aid Canada, which helps to fund clean water uh, in. Madagascar. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not Marrakesh. <laughs> but I'm sure Marrakesh too yeah. is viable. Yeah. 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 Um, and, but again, I apologize for the reason why Darlene, who's holding the camera, can't get closer to us and she'd be blocking all these wonderful people that paid to be here. So she's seated and I apologize. You know normally when we broadcast we get right up close, but again, today's for charity, so be charitable. Um, we've undercut, again, the hard part here, if I was smart like Tristan, I would do the other side asymmetrically, right? Because you look creative and you don't have to worry about balance. But I'm not smart. That's one thing people will say about me. Um, so I'm going to try to balance it. So I started with the undercut like I did here. Then I'm going to try to lay in the baseline here. Then I'm going to try to match the graduation through the back. Now the thing about the razor, I'm not just trying to match shape, I'm trying to match texture because the openness and closeness of the blade. So if one side ends up thinner or thicker than the other side, that's an additional challenge that you don't really have with club cutting with the scissor. I mean, you have it with texture cutting with the scissor. And again, if you, you know, I, I don't really care what tool you use. I mean, can you get a lot of texture with the scissor? Yes. Can you cut clean with the razor? Yes. It's who's using it and how they're using it and kind of how it works for them. Um, so I'm going to cut, start off by cutting clean with the razor because I want to put in a baseline. I better give myself a second just to make sure I get the balance on because I don't have too many opportunities to do that. So, so I, can I, can, I can give you a, a perspective if yes, you just want to ask you. me, I'll help yeah. you out ahead. The good thing is when I did this side, I put my fingers right in the law of her, of her jaw and the line of her jaw and it's so pronounced and defined it's pretty easy to follow. So if she's fairly symmetrical when she looks very symmetrical, which is amazing. That's kind of part of her beauty, that strength of the bone structure. Um, I should be in a fairly decent starting point. So I come in here, hands in the opposite position, right in with the loin of the jaw. Closed razor movement across the hair. And then checking. So again, you know, for me, all the fundamentals of good, good haircutting are the same whether it's a scissor or a razor. Balance feels pretty good. Maybe a tiny bit heavy on my second side, which isn't a bad thing because every time the razor hits into it, it takes a little bit of hair away. So I'd rather be a tiny, tiny, tiny bit heavier here um, because with these fine sections, it does tend to take away a little bit unless you slide your hand past the guide, which I'm not doing that type of cutting here. It's a different type of very deconstructed cutting. Sections remain pretty vertical through to the back of the ear. Let that hair fall in its natural fall. Come down, lock it in. Starting to rotate a little bit. And working my way through. 
I will say that, you know, Natasha's hair is a little tricky for razoring um, because it's not about thickness or density or wave or curl when I think about razoring, for me personally. It's about the type of cuticle. If you run your fingers along her hair, you can probably see it. Even though her hair is, you know, it's fine in some areas, thick in other areas, the cuticle is kind of coarse. It's a little bit like paintbrushy, yeah? So as you're razoring it, it grabs on. So you have to be really, really in control, great tension, and a great consistent movement. Definitely not the easiest hair to razor. Come through. And I'll follow this through until I have this whole baseline put in through the sides of the cut, and then I'll move into the graduation in the back. I do when I feel like I need to touch something up, especially in an area like this that's meant to be clean. I have no problem taking out the scissor and doing a little touch up because the thing is, the razor is not the best tool to take off tiny amounts of hair, at least for me. So when I feel like, oh, I do want to tighten this up just a little bit, I'll come in and use point cutting with the scissor. And as Tristan said, it's kind of interchangeable for me. But I feel like I can point cut off smaller amounts of hair than I can razor off typically. Better. And then back to the razor. Okay, I'm going to carry on and we'll move down the line to uh, Mr. Tristan Morrison. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's funny why I started to do this. One of the when I met Gerard 25 years ago, I was just finishing my uh, staff training, and he came. It was just a wee lad. And this is this is one of the first haircuts that uh, that he taught uh, taught me, and he was like, I can do this haircut blindfold. And I just got I just got to position my hips. I was a dick. Yeah, he's like, I just got to position my hips. I'm like, you can do it blindfolded, man. <laughs> so I thought I would see if he could still do it blindfolded by getting him a nice challenging. Well, model. at this point in my life, I'm <laughs> kind of blind. Yeah, he's blind. You can't see. Maybe not blindfolded, but I am blind. So I've, I've worked around. I, I'm coming into the layer side, and this is where I really kind of love using a razor. And I'm just working through with vertical sections now. So again, transition from these horizontal sections up in here. And now coming in, we're completely disconnected. So uh, you know, starting a new point in the haircut without the means of a guideline to create a little bit more movement. And I'm coming in and really just kind of working a, a, a loose concave with the razor, opening up the blade a little bit more. One of the things that I found challenging using this for the first little bit is getting the right angle to have it cut hair off. And, and kind of like understanding that the angle of the blade changes according to what you want to see as a result and it also changes based on the material you're cutting and that really takes a little bit sometimes it almost feels um, like the blade doesn't want to cut and it's sliding off the hair and for the first little bit I thought maybe these were dull blades and, yeah. and you know I, I, as I someone that, that yeah, like, sells blades I get people all the time when they first yeah, buy it like more. I think I got I think I got a, a, pa a package of dull blades and I'm like I hate to say it it's you it's not the <laughs> yeah. blades I've never in almost 20 years of razor cutting almost every day, I've never found one of these blades to be dull. But it's, they're like a scissor, they're honed on one side, they're sharpened on one side. And you have to understand that angle of where the sharpness is and how to move the blade. And like a scissor, it's two blades moving up and down. If you just take one blade with a scissor and you go like this, it might cut a little bit, but it might not cut that well either, right? But if you took that and you moved it up and down, it needs momentum which is what we call the stroke. There's lots of different ways to do it. Some people do it with their whole arm, which can be a bit more aggressive, um, take a lot more weight out. I'd like you to get to the point where you can do it with just your pinky, uh, your pointer finger. If you can manage that, then this stuff will be easy. You know, you'll get to that naturally, yeah? Yeah, uh, uh, and I think that, you know, starting with like this is where I started, like Gerard was pointing out with the smaller stroke, and then you kind of move into using your wrist and move into to a bigger stroke, um, you know, and I'm using kind of like a stroke with my wrist right now to get this softer effect. So you can see in the haircut that I get this really strong line from the scissors. I work with just one length technique using no tension so that it's a little bit more heavy through the ends, and then transition into working with like a razor so that I get this looseness and softness to it, you know, on these top areas that are disconnected. 
Um, one of the things that I like to do um, is go through and seal the ends with the scissor. So the, I'm not at a point where I do too much razoring where I don't go through and seal the ends. It's just the finish that I like on the hair, you know. But I see a lot of people using it in the salons, and they don't do that. And I like the effect that it gives as well. Um, as far as using product, I use something that, that has a little bit of a slip to it. So I think that you know, applying something that has a little bit of a slide to it works well that can be reactivated with, uh, with water. And then I'm just gonna transition into working these, still with these vertical sections. The nice thing about it is that automatically, from starting at the front and working around on this side, my over direction changes. So as I get, to, as I start in the front on this side, it's forward over direction. As I cross over the halfway point, it turns into backward, backward over direction it gives you a, an effect of like a beret, if you will, so that you get this, again, asymmetry working quite easily. So if you do want to try asymmetry, start on one side and just work all the way around to the other. And it's a real easy way to start to play with over directions and, and balance it in a shape that you're already probably working on. Mr. Gino. All right. Um, I'm almost actually, I have a few more sections again, taking small sections, working with tension. Again, my whole gradual effect was to, to build the shape into here and then start to slowly tilt it into something a little heavier. So if you can see the inside sections right now, um, again, close to horizontal, really paying attention to my fingers, almost mirroring that exact same section, watching my elevation as I travel through. And again, really thinking about how much distance am I creating for the front, um, and again, matching it through the fronts here. So I get that again, triangular or that shoulder in the back longer to the front uh, effect. Again, I think the name of the game here too is really watching your elevation as I start to move. Uh, I'm not trying to pile a ton of hair in the back here, so really just trying to pop that line slightly a little bit higher so it starts to really soften or even give this rounded effect if you can see from that side profile. Um, again, so it just doesn't drop down. and. Um, we were talking earlier, because she has such thick hair, the last thing I wanted to do was make it look like she had another giant wig on top of her head. So I'm really playing with that softness through. And again, transitioning slightly towards the front so I can get that connection and almost the front is speaking uh, to the, uh, the back is speaking to the front and uh, getting that nice effect. What does it say? It's saying, hey, Hello. I like what you're doing. <laughs> I like what you're I like, saying. I like, what you, I like what's going on. I like what you're saying. <laughs> Often see Gino talking to the hair like that. Uh, like like this. What? He tells, oh. me, he tells me that it's an LA thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a Hawaiian thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. Hair talk, man. Well, I don't know. Tristan last Do this a little pigeon. Yeah, it was a little oh, hair talk. Do this a little <laughs> yeah. pigeon. You guys know he's from Hawaii, right? Has anyone yeah. been, from, been to Hawaii? No one here ever has ever been to Hawaii? Oh, oh my god. I know Gerard here has Woo. pretty much stakes claim Hawaii. I've been sure. there 17 times. Ouch. More than me. Yeah. More than me. I was born and raised there. So <laughs> I think you can probably speak more pigeon than I can. Yeah, bro. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to get any pigeon out of Gino. No, sure. But moving right along here. So I'm progressing up the back of Natasha's uh, beautiful, beautiful hair, beautiful head shape. You can see what's happening there. What I meant by that low graduation. You can see the line with the angle of the jaw and then the shape through the back, slightly more rounded and graduated. Um, this last one or two sections, I think I'll probably take this as two, it's maybe a little thick for one. Um, I like to still be able to see a good clear guideline and, and even though, you know, I, when I think of this type of razoring, it's precision, but it's not geometric. It's kind of a line I use all the time. Even though the haircut, you go, that looks like a graduated bob, why is it not geometric? What happens is, um, because the lines become smudgy, you don't have the same corners and angles. Um, so that's the, you know, geometry has to have some kind of shape to it. So it's kind of a rough sketch of the geometry. And I will start to add a little weight removal before I even cut the line. This is one of the things I really love about razoring. I've just kind of sketched or tipped through. And above the line itself, I've taken out about 40% of the weight. So I'm actually, where I want that, graduation to sit and not have a weight line, I'm like pre-lightening. Um, it's funny because I'm not a colorist, um, and I end up, since I teach razoring a lot, I find a lot of times people can relate to it from color. So I'm literally pre-lightening that by taking away something. 
So this kind of was the pre-lightening. You know, now I'm putting in the line. And I very, you know, I think a great analogy for the razor is enlightener or bleach or something like that. You can do incredible things with it, but you can also destroy hair, right? No doubt about it. What's the difference between getting a great result with enlightener or bleach and destroying it? What's the difference? Anyone? Anyone? Time and care. And where did the time and care come from? You. It's not the bleach. You know, you'd be kind of an interesting hairdresser if you were like, oh, I never use bleach. Bleach is just bad. You know, maybe inexperienced. I think maybe somebody in cosmetology school might say that because maybe they didn't have time and care and experience and they used some enlightener and bleach and had some really bad results and they go, well, I'm not touching that shit again. You know? But eventually, hopefully, they would do it again. If they didn't, don't you think they'd be missing out on a lot in their career? Yeah? I feel the razor is the same way. You know, it's as powerful of a cutting tool as, you know, an enlightener or a bleach is, but it definitely takes time and care, and it's really all about you. You know, you can't go on automatic pilot. Um, back in the day, what Tristan was saying before, when I was kind of, you know, being a jerk and saying I could do this haircut blindfolded, um, I was talking about club cutting with the scissor because I just was like so robotic and I knew exactly what to do. No matter what, I could not do that with the razor. I just couldn't. There's no way to do that blindfolded. I think you could, Gerard. No. <laughs> We're all willing to watch. <laughs> We're all willing to watch. I buddy, come on. No, no matter what my level of skill is, um, I could not razor cut blindfolded. And you know, not even because of the danger of it, just because you have to look at the hair when you razor cut it. If you don't look at it, you cannot cut it. So it's not just the shape, it's not just precision, it's not just geometry, there's a lot of feeling involved. All right, so there's my base shape on the underneath, which is looking good to me. What do you guys think? I like what I'm seeing here. It's exactly what I was hoping for. A nice low graduation with bustle and texture to it. Now this is kind of, for me, a visual test with the razor. So obviously with graduation, we want to comb it down. We want to see that it turns in and it's got that nice bevel to it. Okay, it looks good. But with the razor, there's the extra test of seeing that the texture kind of supports itself, that you've lightened the ends up enough that that hair can kind of do the texture test. And you can get that certain feeling of what's going to happen with it. Okay, so I'm going to close this razor up for a second because I'm going to take these clips out through the top and being an experienced razor cutter, I know that these are dangerous to work with. Having the razor in my hand, dealing with all these clips and all this stuff, this is when even experienced people cut themselves. So, little tip there. I'm going to start to take these down. I'll take the first one down in the back. And then I don't have to re-wet it because it's been tied up. So a lot of safety with the razor is just being smart. Again, everyone watching, if you have any questions, please share them. We'd love to, uh, to hear your thoughts, and we'd love to ask you, you know, I bet a lot of you that are watching watch Hairbrain Live all the time and watch all the education that we do. Um, and we do it because we love the community and we do it to, um, to elevate hairdressing. This is one of the few times you'll ever hear us ask you for something. We are saying that we're doing this to raise money for clean water uh, through Water Aid Canada, and we're asking that Either now or later, you click the little link for uh, Rise for Water and you donate $5 or so. Uh, and that will have money, 100% of it, uh, will go to Water Aid Canada. So please do that. I'm going to get into this back. I'll let Tristan talk and then we'll figure out what we're doing. So Gerard just kind of you know, mentioned about like feeling for the texture. So you can see the texture that I'm getting on, on this and it just kind of gives a little bit of movability um, through, through the top area. Um, as you can see, it's going from shorter to longer this way. Um, I, I love asymmetry and I love kind of playing with it, but there's a sensibility to balance that I like as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come through where this long side's sitting on top and I'm gonna work with the scissor. And I'm gonna start at the front and I'm gonna work a concave to take it shorter from these top areas to work to longer this way. So the top part has a little bit of balance with the underneath having the, the main point of uh, asymmetry. Um, you know, if you're out there watching or you guys are watching, one of the things that I had a challenge with um, of understanding to, to move into a razor, and I, I cut hair with scissors for, for 10 years before I picked up another tool, 
and I don't think you need to wait that long, but I do think you need to do some research. So, you know, one of the first things that I asked uh, some of the people that I admire uh, doing razoring was like, why do you use that razor versus a feather razor? Like, how do you pick your tool and know, know what to use? So maybe Gerard, he's, he's quite enlightened on selections of tools, but like, why that, that razor versus <coughs> another razor? And well, the, 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 the better, the, I have no problem with what razor you use as long as you have a sharp blade. If you want to use a guard, that's fine. If you don't want to use a guard, that's fine. Just make sure that it's sharp. And I like a new blade for every single haircut um, because I want to use something that's very sharp and not going to damage the hair. Um, the benefit of the folding razor is for the stroke and the movement and the momentum. You can't get this by holding it like this. You can move it, but you can't get this actual kind of swing like it's on a hinge. So that beautiful momentum and counterbalance and weight between here and here. Uh, guard or no guard, whatever works for you is fine with me, but you just gotta be able to get that beautiful stroke. So we'll go back to Gino in a second, but since we're here, you can see I'm dropping these pieces down and I'm really tipping them into the weight area. So I don't want a line. This is the thing I love about like a razor graduation. I'm not putting the roof on the graduation. I'm lightening this. I come down here, I bring my hands kind of all the way to the outline so I have a little bit of room because the graduation is between here and the outline. And now that two inches or so, I'm using just the tip of the blade and sifting or tipping through the hair. And you can see literally at that point when it comes free, that's blended into that graduation with no weight line. And it's just to me, I don't care how many times I've done it, which is a lot, every time I'm just like, oh, I love it. You know, that feeling has never gone away. Now we'll, we'll go back over to our good buddy, Gino Chapman. All right, so just while the boys are finishing up their shape, um, what I've done is again, trying to create this softer, get rounder, almost afro texture back into it. Now, one thing I have to say is when we collabed with Vanessa on the Hair Color Magic team for the perm itself, um, you know, some, some demographics of uh, gender, female, male, you know, they lack sometimes the head space or the head shape itself. So it's very, very flat back here. So when she was doing it, she was alternating the curls and alternating the perm rods so we could help to build uh, a better shape through here. And that's why Edie chose the discipline of a slight bit of graduation and really elevating the graduation quite far out so that I can really create these corners through here to, to get this much more head hugging shape. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take a very slight bit of diffuser what I did in the beginning, and I'm a, a huge fan of, again, educating a consumer is the best consumer. So in the beginning of usually, anytime I cut, I usually will cut with something uh, softer like a spray or a cutting lotion. Um, in this case, I chose a cutting lotion just because of the fact is my fabric that I'm working on is a, uh, well now it's a slight curly or coily fabric. So I wanted it to uh, get the moisture as I cut. Each time I comb through the hair, the product is getting distributed through it. So what I'm gonna do is just take a very light diffuse get the dryness through here and I'm gonna to try to expand it as big as possible because we're gonna to try to relive the, the 60s and 70s disco era right now, so. Is it all right if I put a slight noise? Yeah, 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 yeah. of course. So you're gonna ask if it's all right if we put the Bee Gees on. Is it all right? Sure. And then roll yeah. it in. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever on. works for you, dude. <laughs> I happen to be a big Bee Gees fan. I love the Bee Gees. Yeah. Again, so you can see what I'm doing here. I'm taking that little bit of hair that was clipped away bring my fingers down to the outline, elevating a little bit, looking at where the base of the graduation is at the base of the occipital bone, and where the outline is, and really sketching through this. Very, very light, my good buddy um, Lee Clapson, who's another beautiful razor cutter, he had a great analogy, it's like catching a butterfly in your hand. You know, if you go, Ugh, you know, <laughs> something bad's gonna happen. And when you're doing this kind of razor work, if I'm like, Ugh, uh, it is going to be, you know, kind of shattered in a bad way. So you have to be really quite gentle and just literally let the blade just... And the thinner the section is, the more gentle you have to be. Very, very gentle pressure. The longer it takes to cut through here, the better. I just want you guys to look at, imagine, imagine this catching a butterfly. <laughs> imagine him chasing the butterfly like around. Be my butterfly, Tristan. <laughs> Gerard, yes. Jonathan would like to know if you use the layering technique to create fluidity. 
if I use a layer, yeah, I mean layers remove weight in general. So whether it be with the scissor or the razor, layering just means elevating 90 degrees or above. Or if you don't want to get into degrees, it's about removing weight. So anytime the hair is, you know, removing weight. So yes, but I mean that's kind of a general question because fluidity can mean a lot of things. There's no layering here, but I think this is pretty fluid. To me, fluid means there's not like visible corners and stops and starts and bumps and bruises. Um, so fluidity can come from a lot of different things, but yes, uh, layering can create fluidity. Thank you for your question, Jonathan. So I'm just going to work on tightening up this, this kind of fringe area here. And so I'm going to come in and kind of follow the curvature, if you will. And you can imagine we do this a lot on, on, on shorter fringes. We follow the cheekbone. And think about like kind of carving out a C. Just to give a little bit of strength. It's coming up around. <coughs> And you can see how that just opens up the cheekbone area. And essentially just combing into that and just really working on refining. But I think that it's a really nice way to have like a rounded fringe. And again, like you know, I've already mentioned in the least looks, it gives you that type of flavor in, in the front, which it is, is quite nice. And, and as far as doing it, I find it fun to kind of put a fringe down a little bit lower like that. Yeah, you have to have your references. You know, Louise Brooks is an actress from the 1920s who's kind of uh, an icon of the bob. You know, I can remember early in my career when I had the pleasure of, you know, working up at Al Sassoon and training there and becoming an educator there. Um, I would always look at, like, the work of the 1920s um, and try to get my bobs to look like that, and they never did. I mean, they looked beautiful, but they always looked like the work of the 1960s which obviously is the work that Vidal was really renowned for. Um, and it wasn't until much later in my career that I learned most of those 1920s bobs were cut with the razor. They weren't cut with the scissor because they were cut by a lot of French hairdressers at the time, and it, they, their, their technique was razor cutting. A lot of the technique that I'm using, period, is razor cutting, uh, comes from French cutting from the 20s, and it's just got kind of reborn in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and then we've just kind of continued with it. So you can notice I'm elevating and rotating. So again, to everyone watching, I want to remind you that what we're doing here, it's a charity event where all the people that are here basically paid knowing that their money was going to be donated to uh, Water Aid for Canada. So we're demonstrating to them specifically, and we thought we'd give you guys a chance to help support and get a little bit of uh, kind of a little bit of a, of a complimentary demo here, but we would love to ask you to donate to riseforwater.com. Even as little as $5 would make a huge difference. Um, I believe that, you know, one of the things that I read was that $25 could provide clean water for the entire life of, um, of someone in, in these countries that need it. As little as $25 per person could create the wells and the resources that they need to have clean water for life. And I thought, wow, how, how unbelievable is that? If I didn't drink lattes for three days, someone in the world would have clean water for the rest of their life. <clears throat> Just think about the larger implications, you know, that these women mostly are spending three to five hours a day going out there to try to harvest clean water. Imagine if they were actually working on the economy of their country. Maybe those countries wouldn't be poor and starving. It's a way to kind of suppress people by not letting them have clean water, you know? So just things to think about and, you know, take it, take it as far as you want. Okay, you can see I'm working into the sides now, put in the corner. Now I'm starting to elevate and rotate this right into the back. And I'll have my whole shape in and then we're going to dive in literally to this pretty meaty bang. She's got a lot of hair up there. We're going to have some fun up there. So I've just finished working this other side and just coming around and you can see the results of the fringe. I do like the disconnection because I like the way that this sits over top. You guys like kind of like how that kind of hangs over as like a little veil, if you will. And you know, for me, Gerard mentioned like you have to have your references. 
And, and I think it's really important to have like a visual idea of, of, of things that you're kind of taking influence from. So I do spend a lot of time like following different things and looking at community works so that I can build a, a, a reference bank of images in my mind so that I can kind of adapt them to my own personal work. And so there's a lot of studying that, that, that happens. The nice thing is the accessibility that we have right now to be able to look at these images. And you know, I always go back, like some of my favorites are, are Roger Thompson and Christopher Brooker. Those are the guys that, that just really inspire me. And, and you know, I'm always find that I'm drawn to reworking some of their their shapes from the 60s and 70s and just kind of adding, you know, my spin to it. And I think, you know, one of the the, the first forms of kind of understanding uh, how to, to, to have your own uh, work go out there is to by taking somebody else's and copying it so you can see what they were after and what they were thinking and you know it goes down to even the tools that I use you know I look at my mentors I, I say why would they be using that comb I buy the comb and I use it and then I can ultimately see this is why they do it it's got this size of teeth or this is why they use that scissor this is why they do this this is why they belong to this group and so, I guess it's like, you know, taking, taking things and adapting them to your own work. Yes. yes. I, I, without a doubt, and I've been saying that for years to everyone that would listen, including, you know, major manufacturers that, um, and salons and, and everyone that, you know, don't even hire people that aren't in tune with social media and self-promoting, getting their work out there because that's like saying they don't know how to sweep the floor. Uh, yeah, I'm a hairdresser, no, I don't, that, what's, what is that thing that I see everyone doing? You know, it's an essential tool that we all have to master. Um, and just because it wasn't there five, 10, 15 years ago, doesn't mean shit. You need to master it right now. and. Trust me, it ain't that hard. I'm 45. I didn't start doing social media until I was like 35. And, you know, so it's not like I was like some young millennial whippersnapper, but I said, this has to happen. And it is, it's designed for really stupid people to be able to use it, right? <laughs> so if, if you, you know, have any intelligence whatsoever, which you all have to, because you're dealing with the things that we deal with every day, people, situations, it's, it's a no-brainer. So don't say, oh, it's technology. It's not like you're coding by putting up a picture and writing a caption, you know what I mean? So long story short, I think it's already there. It's never going to change. Um, it's only gonna get more. I think to a certain degree, you know, what we're gonna see is a little bit more fragmentation, which we've already seen, where things are breaking down into smaller and tighter groups. You know, just being like a mass kind of anything um, isn't going to work as much anymore. It's about being able to, if I'm a hairdresser here in Toronto and I can identify a thousand people that really love razor bobs, <laughs> I'm going to be booked every single day. I don't need to please everyone in the world. I need millions of fans and followers. I couldn't even do, even if I wanted to do a million clients, I couldn't, right? But if I had a thousand people, if I love doing razor bobs or you know, bleach and tone or whatever it might be, and what's happening now with social media is that you can target more and more. And don't be afraid to invest. All these platforms are here to make money. So don't be like, oh my God, now they're charging me. Say, please, I can't wait till Instagram allows me to charge. You know, oh, I can't wait till Instagram charges me a hundred bucks to reach a thousand people in Toronto that love Razor Box. I'll put that hundred dollars down every single week and I'll be the busiest hairdresser in the salon. Simple as that. I mean, you have to have the talent. I mean, obviously, if you're not really good at razor bobs and you're promoting that you are, it probably isn't going to work. So it's not going to replace the talent. It's going to enhance it. Thank you for that brilliant question. Okay, so you can see, same on this side, rotating the hair into the graduation from the top and kind of literally feathering it in. Uh, you know, it's kind of a classic term there where you just, aren't kind of creating any kind of weight line or structure. You're really loosely etching that hair or tipping it in. Um, you know, 
I, I don't believe in rules, you know, because as soon as I say that's a rule, I find somebody who breaks it and does something really good. So with that, my first rule is, the rule is to have enough control that what you want is what you get. Now, for me, I don't enjoy razoring on dry hair because I think it's painful. Um, I know that there are ways to make it not painful um, by making the hair really kind of maybe coated with silicone and flat ironed. Um, but I very rarely, I, I like to work on damp hair with the razor. Um, I can see what the texture is going to really be. I don't want it soaking wet, but I, I don't like dry. Um, other than that, my rule is, you know, be gentle. Just like I would say, you know, if you were unsure with hair that you were going to lighten, you don't go, oh, whatever, I'll just put 40 volume of bleach all over and see what happens. It could be great, you know. If you're unsure for some reason, like I knew, you know, that Natasha's hair here could be challenging to raise her because of its texture. So, but I knew I was going to start off with a very close blade around the perimeter and I could see how it responded. And literally as I'm looking at it, if I start to see you know, these little like white balls on the ends of the hair, it means that it just can't tolerate the razor for whatever reason, and that I'm kind of splitting the cuticle maybe a little too much. So then I would just put, put it down and pick up the scissor. Um, you know, so yeah, I think that there's, you know, I remember very early in my career reading something that Vidal said um, in Cutting Hair with Sassoonle, that there were no hard and fast rules, but there were guidelines to follow. So I definitely think there are guidelines to follow, um, but not rules. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you say away with the razor? yeah. It's just like you know, you kind of have to get that intuition of saying, "No, I wouldn't put bleach on her hair. I'm sorry. She needs five treatments. She needs this, or maybe never." You know, some people's hair just grows out fragile. Yeah. And to a certain degree, the, the razor, it is splitting the hair. I'm not going to say that it's not. It's shattering it a little bit. But it can shatter it in a good way or it can shatter it in a bad way. I mean, very rarely will you see me use the whole flat of a blade like this. So, you know, that's a guideline for me. Um, with the scissor or with the razor? Yeah, so kind of what I'm doing now is almost like point cutting. As I lift this, it's like point cutting from the inside out. So I'm cutting literally one strand of hair at a time, but instead of coming from the outside in like the scissor, I'm doing it from the inside out. And then I comb through, there's still a few pieces. I know I'm trying to get those last two inches of the hair. I think the, the word I love is taper. So it just kind of came off, it just like tapered off. And it has like that quality of Velcro. It's like the negative and the positive. Is there any where how high you won't go up? Uh, the higher you go, the more you're going to collapse it. So knowing that this, I wanted it to be graduated. I stuck to the last two inches of the hair. If for some reason I wanted to really flatten this out, I could go higher. I'd probably, just like any good texturizing, I probably wouldn't go beyond like the round of the head. Because it, it would just stick up, right? Uh, you know, it might be, look how crazy I am. I'm going right to the root, you know? Um, but wh where does that hair go? I mean, it's going to stick up at some point. You know, so I, de I generally would say, you know, no shorter than two inches from the scalp. So I'm just kind of finishing up. Um, I'm going to dry it a little bit looser. I think the overall shape and the balance and everything is, is quite nice. What do you guys think so far? I'm sitting well. I think that, you know, what I like is that she can tuck it and there's some versatility that she can have this idea that it looks a little bit more short with these pieces tucked behind. You know, there's areas that she can clip up and I think that if she doesn't want to wear this kind of on the front, she can tuck it off like this. And, and it takes on a little bit more of a classic shape like this, you know, in, in kind of resemblance to that haircut that I was referencing, the beret. Um, and again, I think that it's a wash and wear haircut, which is what I do like about the razor. It's, it's kind of more like what people are, are wearing their hair like, this more lift-in effect, if you will. Um, still, still with the ability to last eight weeks, because I think it's important that, you know, you, you explain to your client how long your haircut's going to, to, to take to grow out so that they can come back in and book for the proper maintenance. And I do feel if you can do haircuts that last longer, you can charge more. Um, I think that that's one of the ways that people would value it. I've heard it many times from my own clients that, you know, it's kind of worth it to pay more because I don't feel like I need a haircut, especially because I do mostly shorter hair. 
um, and if they feel like if their haircut can last eight weeks, they're willing to go, you know, even more than $20 higher than they normally would because it's got exponential value to look good for three more weeks might actually be worth 50% more, you know, so there's a lot of thought that goes into it. All right, so I'm sealing the ends now with the scissor. So I very often, almost always do this. I like to come back through, maybe it's because my roots is a scissor hair cutter. I like to look at the ends one last time and make sure that they're really sealed, that there's nothing that isn't cohesive. And then we're gonna come in and take a look at the bang of roots there and then we'll be done. I usually, you know, this will be very wash and wear. I love to just put product in this and let it dry naturally. That's kind of, I to put it under like heat lamp so that it's totally dry naturally. Um, if I can avoid picking up a blow dryer, I do. And uh, that's just my thing. All right, coming into the bangs, we're going to dampen these guys. Again, before I even do anything with the length here, I think it's more of a weight thing. I'm going to go through these and I'm going to section by section, I'm going to siphon out using tipping a lot of the weight and then we'll see what's happening with the length and we'll go back over to Gino. Alright, so got the finished shape, I expanded probably bigger than she might normally wear it. You know, I just think it's fantastic just to almost uh, celebrate the texture and having, but you can see the, the rounded shapes and I think the key also is working with depth. How far is the hair strand actually living away from the head? If I took this and got quite close to it, I think she would look like a little orphan Annie, which is probably not the, the, the idea effect that I want. So again, working with the parameters that we spoke from before, how far that strand lives, I know the softer the longer I can, I can get much more of this softer expansion shape. And again, you can see quite the, again, I always, the kind of roundness, even though we graduated through here, it is getting shorter, but slightly long towards the front, but it is getting that softer shape. Um, I think the two shapes always work quite well together, especially when it's going into this like, very classic afro wee bit. And I think the perm itself took off. And um, we did have color put on it, but I also think we toned it with um, a red conditioner, I believe so. So the color that was previous, the perm took a different toll on the color, and we retoned it with the red conditioner back in again. You know how it, it was wrapped? Do you know anything about the pattern? Uh, yes, it was wrapped. Do you do any perms? Oh, no. no. <laughs> All the perm would be on the floor with the hair in it. So uh, <laughs> she put it in her pocket and take it home with her. And that's her perm. Um, I believe so. If I remember looking at it, uh, the perm itself was wrapped in very circular pattern, almost like a radio. You want to almost take it from the middle and expanding that radio and moving it all the way through. Um, I know the top section was a slight bit tighter, slight bit looser through the middle, and then staggered perm rods all the way through. So again, creating some texture, creating some headspace back here uh, to give the illusion that it's bigger than what it really is. Um, again, this is a little bit more exaggerated, but um, and again, she can take it. I know she straightens out her fringe um, normally, so she can still do that if she wants to, or she can go for this really kind of wash and wear if we're talking about a wash and wear type of look. Um, the thing I have to say is, I did finish with a wet spray. I don't know how many of those revive the wet spray, but I find sometimes if you use a jet propulsion spray or something quite uh, fast, especially if you're doing some type of editorial work or bigger work, you can really blow the cuticle up. If you're not really prepared on what way the nozzle is working with. So I find a, a wet spray is a nice drying aspect in the air, sits on the hand, really keeps the texture of what you're trying to work with. So I, I was trying to bring back the wet spray for those if you don't use them as much. But again, it's just a, a nice glorified almost after the texture back in the bit, and I think it's quite fun for her. Beautiful. Excellent. Jim, can you talk a little bit to the viewers at home about um, Water Aid and Rise for Canada? Absolutely. We're going to go back to Rise for Water. For those, if you're not clicked on the donation button, please do. A little bit goes a long way for everyone. And again, I don't think anyone in this room today or anyone in the viewers right now would be anywhere if they weren't, if they didn't have any clean water for themselves. So we do say a little bit, even if it's as little as $5 itself. Again, all of it goes to a great charity. For those who are in the room, we always let's say thank you for actually, all the money goes back to the charity, but for coming and visiting and hanging out with us and just sharing a day of education. And for those, um, if you are even planning to be across the border, because we have uh, some Americans in the house, or here in Canada, if you decide to, the show is tomorrow. 
So if you decide to even buy some tickets and come to the show tomorrow, for those of you in the house, if you don't, we do have a show tomorrow. All the great artists that are, the Hair Color Magic team is uh, at another space. Um, we have Peter Gray, Alan Ruiz, Frank Lazuri upstairs doing uh, dressing hair, and they'll be on stage tomorrow as well as my boys right here. Um, like I said, putting on a great show for a great cause for those if you need to donate trying to raise as much money as possible. Thank you, Gino. Okay, so with the bang, um, I went through and I took about four sections and I did that tipping technique first and removed all the weight. And then I came in with the scissor to just seal the line. Um, I didn't want to take them much shorter, but I just held it in the comb and I just point cut the line. I think that this is just about where I need it. I'm gonna use a little bit of scissor work on her knee uh, for any of these I can't tell what's attached and what's not attached at this moment, so we need to clean this off a little bit. And I try to, um, whatever possible, do all this as much as I can with the scissor. Um, I just, I kind of enjoy it, and I also think that it grows out a little bit softer. Uh, sometimes you do have to pick up a trimmer or an edger to do it, and I think that that's fine. But when it's as delicate as this, not so bad. I love what's happening with the color. If you can see now, you know, the distance being right there. See what I mean by that little anime kind of bob thing, you know? And I, I always love in those anime, like, and this is one of the great things about razor cutting. It makes the ends very flexible. So you can easily bend these either with your hands or a brush because you're tapering the ends. So you can start to get that fun kind of effect into the hair. Um, I could even do a little cross checking through the comb looking at that rounded back in the graduation, making sure there's no heavy corner here. Again, I tend to almost always, except for sometimes very, very short razor cuts that I want to be kind of maybe a little raw, I almost always use a scissor to do some finishing work. That's just my own preference. Cleaning up the neck. Then we'll look for some product. You know, I've been having fun. You know, I'm lucky because I get to work with a lot of different products. Um, I probably at this point work with 10 or 11 different product companies on a regular basis. Um, so I get to try a lot of different things. And um, one of them is Aveda. And one of the products that I love for this kind of finishing is the Brilliant uh, Universal Styling Cream. Somebody grab some of that for me. Because I think I just put that in and kind of push it into place and let it dry. Um, and it, it does kind of really give this slightly greasy in a good way for this kind of hair really 1920s kind of look, when, and with, that's kind of what I was going for here. Really emulsifying it well, and working it in, and then really combing it through roots to ends. So I really want to make her hair a little greasy in a good way. Again, if there are any questions at home, I think we're getting close to our final, final, final here. Thank you if you've kind of stuck with us throughout. Thank you, thank you even more if you've had the heart to donate. You know, as I mentioned, we do this type of education all the time online for people, always kind of giving, giving, and you know, we very rarely ask for you to give much back, but I think that this is a great opportunity to do that, to uh, donate to WaterAid and use the Rise for Water website to do that. Just kind of finishing off, I went in kind of reminiscence of the 90s and cut a little thin, just kind of through the, the crown area. Kind of making reference, there was an old collection that I that I kind of liked. It's called Geisha Punk. I kind of did these little fins that I thought was ra rather cool in the the nineties. I think it was in like mid nineties. A little later than that, actually. Two thousand. Yeah. yeah, early two thousand. Yeah. So just kind of making some some kind of fun areas with that, um, and just using a little bit of uh, air control just to give the styling, you know. But very loose, like, I mean, I, I used a bit of a brush just to kind of get a bit of shine to it, but I, you could have done it with your hands as well, like, not using the flat iron really as much these days for this type of work. I sort of recap, really just working uh, with uh, taking a circular section and dividing it into four, four triangles, working with one length, uh, starting up a little bit higher and cutting this rounded one length. Then laying some graduation that's shorter in the front to longer towards the back. Um, and then taking these uh, triangles down on this side and working with the razor with horizontal sections disconnected. And then really working a concave layer into this side to give it some, some looseness. You know? And I think that uh, it's just fun and suitable for, 
to her on my model. You know, I spent a lot of time talking to her, and she, you know, she's into. To, to yeah, she was complaining and, about that. She's, yeah, she didn't like it. Shut up and cut some hair, man. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't talk to you enough, man. I just wanted a haircut. Do I have a question in regards to your haircut? Oh, okay. Um, I was just wondering, so it was inspired kind of around for, like the 1920s era. Uh -huh. Obviously, it's been modernized, but uh, so in that era, a lot of the styling was figure waves. And, yeah. Uh, and those are usually done on Amazing. So just think about it this way, because this top piece, it reaches, you see how tapered it goes, but it reaches all the way like a one length haircut. So that allows the whole wave pattern to come into play. Where if you layer it or traditionally graduate it, that's where you get that point. Even if you curl it with an iron, you're like, okay, the wave stops here. And it doesn't kind of have that. It could look really cool. And now, oh, it's a beach wave. Just run your hands through it. Beautiful. But if you're trying to get that, like, whoa, wait a minute. It looks like Marcel just came down, you know, from heaven and did it. You, this is how they did it. You know, because when you think about it, these pieces need to be long enough. Look at this. This reaches all the way to the outline. So if I put a wave into that, the wave goes from here all the way down to there. Rather than if I club cut it, it stops somewhere. So, yes, and you know, the, the bigger question there is in general for me, great razor cutting brings out wave and texture. It can be wonderful for curly hair, but you really have to know what you're doing and understand the curl pattern and which way the blade should go because it could quickly, just like bleach, you know, you, your hair looks good. It looks, they use some kind of bleach or high lift on it. It could easily be all on the floor or frizzed out. Somebody knew what they were doing to some degree, obviously, when they colored your hair. And it could be the same with a razor. It could easily go really bad, just like bleach. So it's really up to who's doing it. So you can kind of see my idea here. Um, just putting in the universal styling cream, combing it through. I kind of like the way it's got that like little kick. And you can see what's happening. Um, obviously, it could blow dry. You could do whatever you want. I don't really want to because I don't enjoy it. And I love the way it looks like this. And then just kind of coming in, looking at the bang one last time. And this I am, you know, now as a final, I'm using the scissor blunt. I think it's a good, just because her skin and everything's so beautiful. I love that line. I very rarely like a line next to skin, but um, I kind of softened this enough and I just, you know, she can wear it personally with the bones and everything. It's like most people I just like prefer to see it a bit softer. I'm gonna get married. The bells, the bells are ringing. Okay, Tristan, take it away. Yeah, so this is kind of the, the final look, and you know, suitable for, for her. Get the final peak for that. You know, just a soft layered bob. You know? And you know, the other thing we've done is come in and just taken this off to, to make it a little bit more balanced. But I think that it, it wears really nice and has a lot of movability. I think they look good as you know, I sent to our model. Yeah, very well. And there's my finished look. Again, a simple bob. I, I think you know, Tristan obviously took a lot of the same inspiration, but made it a bit more complex in a beautiful way. Here we're working with incredible texture by Gino. So a nice, diverse little lineup of techniques and textures. I hope you guys at home really enjoyed that. I'm going to ask you one last time, if you enjoy what Hairbrain does for the community, for the industry, uh, for you, please go on to riseforwater.com and think about making a contribution. That money will go 100% to help clean water. Uh, around the world and specifically in Madagascar. Peace out guys, thank you so much. Peace.